you can completely disagree with someone. I think that their kind of view is wrong. But I think it is not incompatible with also saying this person is a human, they are a valuable person in society, they are worthy of respect and love. And afterwards, we can still kind of shake hands and, and kind of go on. Welcome back to 40 Minute Mentor, your pocket-sized career mentor on a mission to raise aspirations and inspire the next generation of category-defining founders. From purpose-led entrepreneurs to world-class investors and even Olympic champions, you'll learn firsthand from today's successful leaders on what it takes to be brilliant, all in just 40 minutes. In today's special advice feature series, I'm joined by great friend of JBM, Scarlett McCabe, who is co-founder and CEO of DebateMate. We're also joined by Lewis Iwu, debate champion, author of Words That Win, and co-founder and CEO of Purpose Union. You may have guessed it from the choice of guests already, but in today's episode, we'll be diving into the topic of debating. We'll be talking about how this skill can help us in our daily lives and business, but also discussing the importance of disagreeing, which feels very topical given the upcoming election. A very big warm welcome, Scarlett and Lewis. Thank you so much for joining us on the 40 Minute Mentor. How are you both doing? Good. Yeah, good, thank you. Really happy to be here, really excited. Well, the pleasure is all mine. We're going to get you warmed up, as we always do, with a few quick fire questions. We've got three today. And we'll start with ladies first, Scarlett. So please finish the following sentences after me. I feel most energized when? After I've done a Barry's boot camp class first thing in the morning. No, I'm joking. Although that is, to be honest, when I feel most energized. But my mum was like, you can't say that. So... I think it's when we're running a training session and I'm working with people who really are so nervous and have gone through their whole career and never put themselves in situations where they're put on the spot or have to speak in front of groups of people. And that finally that light bulb switch moment goes off, something clicks and they're like, yes, I can do this. And they get a big smile on their face. And that honestly, it's the best feeling, whether it's an adult, a child, whatever it is, like it's such a good feeling. So that gets me really energized. Oh, love that. Love that. Same question to you, Lewis. Uh, it was a much worthier answer than uh, what well, I was going to give. I was going to say after a good sort of musical gig, just that, that feeling afterwards, it's like amazing. Yeah. Okay. Two different but great ones. My biggest failure to date is, Lewis, we'll go with you first. Probably not learning how to drive or swim. <laughs> Been on my list for like 20 years. Uh, play. I, it took me a very, very long time to drive. Embarrassingly, my wife went into labor and I still couldn't drive her to the hospital. So it was, uh, yeah, I was like, I really have to. And we live in the sticks of the countryside. So when I moved out of London, I was like, I've really got to learn this. So I can definitely relate to that one. Scarlett, what about you? What's your biggest failure to date? I don't really believe in failure because I think failure is quite a negative concept. So I was thinking about this and I was like, I don't really do, don't really do failures. It did take me till I was 37 weeks pregnant with my second child to pass my driving test. And I did technically fail that five times before I did it. But again, it was just part of the plan. You it's know? all part of the plan. Part of the journey. So I don't really believe in failure. Okay. No, I, I, I really like that reframing of that. Thank you for sharing. Good mentorship means to me. So I think a good mentor, someone who's got your back for sure, like rooting for you, but isn't afraid to ask you really difficult questions and crucially then listen to what you're saying and listen to your answers. The best mentors I've had have always really challenged me and then kind of gone with the answers and like engage with that rather than their preconceived notions of how things should be. So I think not being afraid to ask difficult questions and being a good listener. That's a great one. Lewis, what about you? What does good mentorship mean to you? Yeah, very similar. You know, challenge and being there to kind of constructively challenge and prod and probe, but also being generous with, with their network and helping you to kind of uh, access spaces and open doors with the power of their networks. Great answers. I feel like our audience, we've already got a, a little bit of insight into your musical tastes, interpretation of what failure means and a bit about mentorship we're going to dive into your mentorship now and i'm super excited to do that but before we get on to the topic of debating which is going to i guess take up a lot of this conversation would love to get a sort of snapshot a 60 second snapshot of your cv if that's okay just so our audience can get to know you a bit better so scarlett can you kick us off with that please sure so i grew up in london only child 
single mum. Started debating when I was at school. It completely changed everything for me. Uh, I studied Arabic after I left school before I went to uni and spent quite a lot of time in the Middle East. I can't speak any Arabic now, so don't test me. But back then I was all right. Went, studied in London, lived in Jamaica uh, for a few years after uni where I was running the charitable program. So debate mate out there, met my now husband, was on track to be a lawyer, to be a corporate lawyer, had the training contract was due to start and then never actually did it because I um, set up the business of Debate Mate with my mum, which I've now been running for the last eight years or so. I am really passionate about what we do and believe very strongly that being a good communicator, being confident in the way that you communicate are skills that you can learn. And now kind of we're looking at how we use technology and AI to help us scale that. I have two young kids two daughters who are amazing and totally wild and keep me on my toes and on stop and I live in Brixton. Amazing thank you Scarlett. Lewis can you give us your 60 second uh, rundown of your CV as well please? Yeah I'm currently um, the co-founder of a social purpose strategy firm called Purpose Union. We advise organizations, companies, nonprofits, philanthropists, politicians on how to have a social impact and we've been running for, for six years before that, I was the director of the Fair Education Alliance, which was a, a sort of organization trying to bring together lots of different organizations to try and close the education gap in the UK. And in and around that, sort of worked in various consultancies, advising businesses on how to make the world better, but also how to make money at the same time. Running alongside that, I've been a debate coach, most recently with the England National Debating Team, but I've coached all over the world. And I've actually worked with Scala at Debate Mate as well, trying to sort of make sure that debating is accessible to everyone. Born and raised in London, but for my sins, a, a Manchester United fan. Long suffering. Love it. Love it. And my wife is a Man U fan too, and I'm an Aston Villa fan. So we regularly sit on the other sides of the room uh, <laughs> when we're talking football. Awesome. So much to explore. You're both entrepreneurs. So I think it would be remiss of us not to dig into the, the businesses that you're building at the moment and hear a bit more about them. So Lewis, do you mind sharing a bit more about your company? And I guess I'd love to know particularly the, the biggest highlight of your journey so far. Yeah. Uh, so as I mentioned, you know, where we're an agency that tries to kind of marry strategy and comms and help organizations really kind of answer some of the biggest questions that they can ask. Why do we exist? How do we respond to the big social and environmental challenges in the world? How do we stand out for what, what we're doing? And how do we do all of that in an authentic way? And those are quite big, quite tough questions. And it ranges from everything from the world of sports, where we've done a lot of work, to the legal sector, retail, technology, financial services, and health, plus many more. And it's been fascinating because we get to work with some of the the most interesting and dynamic and purpose-driven people out there, uh, ranging from sort of Malala to Gary Novel to sort of big organizations like Google, but also startups who are trying to disrupt the world of energy. And over the years, our work has started off in the UK, but now about half our work is outside of the UK. So there's a global dimension to that as well. And I guess the, you know, in terms of what's really exciting is being able to work in our our team. We've got some really motivated, smart, really passionate people who I learn from every day and and being able to kind of create the space for uh, really interesting people to do amazing, impactful work. And learning from them for me is is a joy that I get coming into work every day. Sounds amazing. And what an an impact you're having. Really cool. Thank you for sharing. Scarlett, tell us more about Debate Mate and the impact you have. I've I've had the privilege of seeing it in action and it really is amazing. So yeah, tell us a bit more if you don't mind. And I'd also love to hear what the the best bit of the journey of building has been so far for you. So yeah, Debate Mate is a social business. So we started off life as a charity 15 years ago with the aim of making debating skills accessible to everyone everywhere with a specific focus on social mobility. So the charity has a focus on working with children in areas of high child poverty and using university debaters to set up and run after school debate club, essentially. Uh, We've been going 14 or 15 years now, started off just in London with 30 schools and we now have nearly 6,000 children a week going through the programme. 
predominantly across the UK, but we also have quite a big global footprint. We're in over 45 countries now, I think, online. So yeah, it's amazing. And Lewis has been involved from the very beginning, which I'm sure we'll go into, but has taught on the program all across the world with me and, and with the team. And honestly, the I mean, you've seen it, James, the kids who come to our program are doing amazing things like the ones who started in the first year are now really senior in really amazing places and they're just phenomenal but the reason why sort of I'm here today is that we have a business that runs alongside the charity which essentially uses the same way of teaching young people the key skills of debating being able to communicate well being able to listen being able to think critically and creatively um, to being able to have empathy and most importantly kind of being able to have confidence and we have take that skill, but instead of teaching in the classroom, we teach it in the boardroom. So we teach it to professionals all across the world, in all industries, at every level. So we work with kind of C- the apprentice and entry level all the way up to C-suite. Like Lewis, we kind of, the majority of our work used to be in the UK. Then COVID happened and everything went online. And now it's probably about 50-50 international versus UK. And we have the most incredible clients who are just, amazing to work with, not least because they're so committed to upskilling their employees and their team members. And it's amazing because the people that teach on the program on the business teach on the program in the schools as well, the charity. And actually about 40% of our facilitator pool, so the people that actually teach on the program, did debate mate when they were at school. So it's like this whole ecosystem. So they did it at school, they went to uni, they taught on the program. Now they're like working for us full time or they're going in and teaching investment bankers or lawyers or consultants. Um, so yeah, it's really cool. I mean, my job is amazing and I absolutely love the people I work with. I think it's hard to pick a highlight because it's all amazing. And, you know, we've done some really cool partnerships. We did a program with the Premier League years ago, which was so ironic because, like, I am not a football fan. I have zero chat. And we uh, were partnered with five Premier League clubs. And I really had to up my game because, like, we were going to speak to all the, the coaches and everything. And I literally had no chat. That was really cool because we were teaching coaches and academy players communication skills off the pitch to improve their skills on the pitch. So that was really cool. But... You know, we've worked all across the world. We've represented the UK in Dubai at UK National Day. We managed to bring some students over and ran some events. So that was a big highlight. But yeah, it's all great. It's all fun. Love it. It's so great. And I, I love that virtual circle of, of people that have been in the program as kids coming through and actually working with you now and having like kind of paying it forward to both kind of big organizations, but also to other young kids to benefit from the work you're doing. It's, it's amazing to hear. Lewis, I'd love to know, I guess founder life is a, a roller coaster and you're constantly evolving and, and learning. What has been the biggest sort of learning curve for you as a founder? Always invest time in getting the right people in and giving them the tools to be able to thrive is the number one thing. I mean, we've got a great set of services, but, you know, where are people business? If you don't have the people, the talent, if they're not thriving, then you could have the best services in theory and and no one to kind of help deliver them. So for us, for me personally, it's been that sort of learning that thinking about people and what gets them kind of motivated is super important, you know, it's like a football team or sports team. You can have people who on paper have got, who are great, but you've got to give them the environment to kind of thrive in. They've got to feel supported and championed. They've got to do projects that interest them and excite them. But also they've got to do projects which stretch them as well. And that occupies a lot of, you know, it's myself and two other co-founders that pretty much occupies our time. I think the second is, you know, we work with some amazing clients we were doing some fantastic things, but a lot of the time, because of the nature of what we're working on, which is the big question of how does one sense, how does business kind of marry being profitable and actually successful with wanting social value? That agenda kind of has been on a bit of a roller coaster. And so, you know, one big challenge or constant kind of thing I've got to kind of consider and, and factor in is. We're, all, we're often shoulder to cry on for our clients or uh, an outlook for their frustration internally because they want to do great things, but there may be various organizational blockers from their end. So for us, really thinking about where our clients are, really helping being a good critical friend. And yes, there's a technical aspect of building a strategy or delivering a communications plan or, uh, or kind of crafting this amazing bit of content. 
that's of course important, but the relationship and kind of really kind of building that partnership with, with our clients is for me, not that I underestimated it, but I'm glad we're invested in it and it's really crucial to what we do. Yeah, totally. Makes sense. Thank you for sharing that. Scarlett, before we come on to debating, I'd love to hear about your experience as a founder. What for you has been uh, the hardest part? And similarly to Lewis, what have been uh, the biggest learnings on the journey? It's a really good question. And I think I come at it from quite a unique angle because I also work with my mother. So it adds a whole level of kind of interesting complexity to the dynamic. And overall, I think we've managed it really well. And kind of family business is the oldest business model for a reason. But I mean, Lewis has sat being at the table when mum and I are like challenging each other. And it's, you know, it's great because we can talk really openly to each other. But that I think has been... So that everything that I've had to deal with has been in the context of that. I would say, like Lewis said, people, I mean, people are everything. Like I honestly, we've made some chronic <laughs> mistakes in the past where you hire amazing people who've got wicked CVs and then they come in, you're like, this is just not going to work. And for us, we're lucky because we're so mission driven and because the culture is so strong that actually everyone that works with us, the majority of them have kind of come through the ecosystem. So actually they're just so on it and I do think you can teach knowledge. To be honest, you can teach skills. It's attitude. It's like what you value. I'd say that's the most important thing. And I've realized that, you know, when times have been really tough, like COVID was just, it was, yeah, as for everyone, just such a, a mind spinner. I was about to swear then, can't do that. Um, such a mind spinner. And particularly the first lockdown, you know, our team were just amazing. And just fully, it was like, let's just do it. Whatever we can, let's throw pain in the wall, see what sticks and go with it. And that was literally what we did so people attitude and I think I guess the hardest thing I've had to deal with is there's no playbook like there's no there's no like oh, this is how you set up and run a business I mean there are a million and one self-help books but like there's no playbook for your business in your context and I think what I've realized over the last sort of recent period and it's very much my strategy going forward is you don't just sit and wait for kind of things to make sense like you actually have to go out and figure it out and create your own playbook and I keep saying to my team I'm like I feel like I used to be in the like boot of a driverless car and now we're like in the front seat we're in the pilot seat of our private jet and we're like going forward but we have to create our own route and we have to create our own way of doing it and you have to kind of pick and choose from what everyone else has done and this is why good mentorship is so important and like create, but you've got to create your own one because what works for you, James, or you, Lewis, isn't going to work for me. So having a group of people you can speak to and founders and networks is great, but you've got to create your own playbook. So that's been the hardest thing, but also the biggest takeaway. Yeah, yeah, great advice. Thank you for sharing that. Well, we've got to talk about debating. This is why we're here, and we've already talked about the the impact debate mate has had, and clearly debating has had on both of your lives and careers. So, Lewis, you're a former debating world champion. You have coached like the international levels. You travelled the world. Tell us a bit bit more about how you got into debating in the first place, and a bit more about how your experience in debating has influenced the leader that you are today. Yeah, I mean, I, I got into it. I mean, I, I did a lot of sport at school. I think I played football, basketball, athletics, cross country. It was just a very sporty school. And that was kind of it, really. We didn't do anything else competitively. And then sort of we had the opportunity to have a debate club in school. It sounded pretty interesting and different. And a teacher recommended I, I take part. So I did it and kind of got the bug and ended up sort of getting the opportunity to represent the school at a competition. Then we did more competitions. And then actually in my sort of sixth form, heard about this thing called the England debating team, a school's debating team, and was lucky to get selected for that. Didn't really know much about it other than you get to go to a competition and compete against you know 30 other countries. And then pretty much, you know, that sort of was an amazing opportunity. And I, I really decided it was something that, meant a lot to me and I felt I could do quite well at. I continued doing it for university, was lucky to, as you say, kind of win, what does Oxford win the World Debating Championships, which was interesting. It was in Thailand in a kind of beach resort for eight days over Christmas. Uh, and you compete, it's quite surreal. You compete against 400 other teams. And after that, then sort of stopped, retired, and then actually turned my 
my hand to coaching and so I ended up coaching a number of national teams, including the England, England national schools team. And that was it. I mean, in terms of kind of what I've taken from it, other than just meeting some really amazing people from quite literally all over the world, uh, many of whom I've, I've met with Scarlett, where we, we've traveled and, and run workshops together. But the three is, you know, listening, uh, Scarlett mentioned it, and actually not just kind of passive listening, but listening and thinking and critically evaluating fairly quickly what somebody's saying and kind of decoding what are they really saying? There's the stuff that we hear, there's stuff that kind of sets under that. And I think the basic script for, for that has been immensely useful in kind of what I do now. Learning how to speak up and stand up for yourself and have a voice in a room. I was, uh, last week I was at the board of a, a major, you know, FTSE 100 company and he asked a question by, by the CEO on the spot, which I hadn't really thought of. And, you know, being able to kind of on your feet come up with a an answer I think is very helpful. And I guess the final thing for me is there's a role in debating called the the summary speaker and your job is to, at the end of the debate, as the name implies, summarize all the big ideas that have been kicking about for the last hour. It's quite a difficult job. If you do that role over and over again, you get very used to taking lots of content ideas and synthesizing that into a package that is very clearly distilled for an audience to kind of go, okay, I can make sense of this. And that's actually been immensely helpful because the world we're in is complex. Climate change is complex, as is education inequality. And the ability to turn the complex into something that is much easier to understand without oversimplifying it is a huge skill that I really wouldn't have if not for the basic. Love that. So impactful. And I'm really regretting. I, I sat in on debate to school and never put my hand up and, and went for it. And I'm seriously regretting it now because it, it just feels that I would be... Never too late. Never too late. Yeah, yeah. We'll come on to that because I feel like this is something a lot of our audience will hopefully get really excited about getting stuck into. And thank you for that, Lewis. Scarlett, to you, I guess, it sounds like you got into debating fairly early on. So tell us a bit about that. And I'd love to know you specifically, what are the biggest skills and lessons that debating has taught you. Why is it such a, a crucial skill that we should all think about having? So I've got nowhere near as many trophies or medals as Lewis. I mean, Lewis is so humble. Like he is genuinely twice the best debater in the world. Like he's incredible. And actually when I started debating at school, I wasn't like Lewis, I'm not really sporty, um, was actually kind of average. And I've got quite a lot of learning difficulties as well. So I was never really like achieving as well in school I knew I could so I was very frustrated and quite disengaged in the whole process until my history teacher Mrs Morwood shout out Mrs Morwood who still to this day will be Mrs Morwood even though I know her first name I can't call her her first name she was like you need to start doing debating because you're quite rude to the teachers you're not as engaged as you could be and I think you will really enjoy debating and I was like no it's really weird I don't want to do it the weird kids do it and she was like no honestly like come you've got to come along so I did and literally overnight like I was like this is amazing because I can argue they teach me how to argue and I'm better at arguing after the processes and skills than like the what they taught me and people listen to me and so like it was a very quick transition for me and I went to like li- about a week later went to my first competition where my mom my mom took us my mom was like a classic tiger mom helicopter mom whatever you want to call it she was at everything at everything she took us uh, and she only got half an hour on the parking meter because she didn't think that she didn't realize it was an all day thing that was a knockout all this kind of stuff anyway um we did really well and we got through to the final at the end of the day and the car got towed so the car there was no car at the end of the day but it was an amazing experience and actually i remember because i was a few years below Lewis at school and i remember watching because we didn't we got through from that day and then we broke to the kind of the bigger finals where Lewis and his debating partner Will were and I remember watching them in the final thinking oh my god these guys are amazing and it was really inspiring and it was actually very much the kind of inspiration behind Debate Mate and why mum my mum set up the charity because she just saw how what an incredible activity this extracurricular was and how kids are giving up their weekends and giving up their holidays and giving up Christmas to like go and debate against each other and she just couldn't believe it so it completely changed everything to me I wasn't as good as Lewis but I have taken so much from it and I use the skills that I learned at school and university every day I think the reason why it is so transformational and exactly as Lewis said because it teaches you to listen it teaches you to challenge well and it teaches you all the kind of skills that you need to basically be able to be in any room 
at any time with anyone. Like it's really, there are no situations, I think, where Lewis or myself or anyone in my team or anyone that we know from the kind of debating community, there's very few situations where they wouldn't be able to have something to say, to have an opinion, to have a voice, to speak up, to add value. Because debating just teaches you the skills that you need to have that kind of core confidence. And there's back, you know, 15 years ago or whenever we were debating, there was a specific way of debating. Like you could always tell the debaters, they always spoke in a certain cadence and they use the same kind of words. But now it's really changing and people are being a lot more authentic in the way that they they show up and there's a lot more diversity. A lot is in part due to debate mate, but also I think the, the, world, is, the world is changing, isn't it? So yeah, I think it's that capacity to just handle it in any situation. That's why I reflect on how important the skill set is. And who wouldn't want that? You know, to be thrown into any situation and be able to handle yourself. I mean, it's, it's such a great, great skill to have. Lewis, what makes someone a good debater? You are the best of the best. So tell us what it is, and are there common traits, whether it's characteristics or prerequisites that uh, or skills that you need to have to kind of to start that journey and, and get good at debating? Yeah, I think there's probably four. I get asked this question a lot and it really does depend. I'm not going to give that cop out of a question. But there's four core things. I think one is being able to simultaneously listen and think critically about what you're hearing is key. And kind of what separates debating from public speaking, I guess, is it's a dynamic exchange, right? Or, or you know, another term I like to use is competitive storytelling. So you've got to be able to listen understand what are the implications of what I'm hearing and and kind of, is this important? Is this not that important? Should I respond to it? Should I leave it? How do I respond to it? All kind of fairly quickly. I think the second is you've got to react. And again, um, you know, some of the best debaters, whether they are competitive debaters or in politics or business, they're able to kind of be in a room and pick up cues. Are the audience on side? Did they enjoy that point? Were they sort of a bit unsure about that point? Do I need to probably adjust? The hardest thing, I think, for anyone giving a speech in public is to make mid-speech adjustments based on the vibe they get in a room. And, you know, I'm sure Scarlett's done it. I've done it. You're sort of about to give a speech somewhere. And just because of kind of the setup, the atmosphere, you cross stuff out and you put new stuff in. Being that dynamic is, is really difficult, and that's kind of state of the art. But I think that's what makes a good debater. I think the, the third is being able to get that balance between emotion and reason. I think some feel you've got to be hyper rational and make logical arguments. We're not robots, we're humans. We have desires and ambitions and wants and fears. And, and being able to kind of understand that emotion is actually powerful is key. But at the same time, it's not just shouting and kind of really kind of going after someone there is a flow and a logic that you have to use. And so getting that balance right between emotion and reason is, is another one. And the final thing I would say is, I think this is an important one. And again, Scarlett raised it when she talked about authenticity. We all have a speaking style that we're comfortable with. And, you know, in my book, Words at Win, I sort of talk about there's a states person, there's a fire brand, there's a conversationalist, and there's a professor. All of those styles can be persuasive. But the great thing is we are comforted by our our sort of our default speaking style. It's a safe harbor for us. It's reassuring. There's not that much cognitive load that we we give ourselves because it's much more natural. Where I think people go wrong is they have this idea of what a good speaker is and they try and mimic it wholesale. And that's really difficult because you're literally pretending to be someone that you're not, which we know is much more difficult, much more stressful and distracts from you being able to do other things like listening. So for me, I think the, the best debates are able to kind of embrace their natural speaking style, elevate it here or there, and maybe have moments where they depart into other speaking styles, but they don't try and mimic something that they're not. And I think where I fear where people have gone wrong where they've been coached is they've been shown a video of an amazing speaker and have gone, speak like that person, as opposed to what lessons can we take and extract from that person to apply to your speaking style. So I think those are the sort of ingredients for a good debater. Oh, thank you so much for sharing. That's really, really interesting. I'm sure everyone can 
think about examples of, say, politicians that you can just tell it's not their natural style, but they are mimicking a, a, another famous politician or whatever. So that's, uh, yeah, I can definitely, that really, that really makes sense. Coming on to talking about debating in business and the value of that for companies. Scarlett, you obviously work with a lot of organizations um, and have, have sort of transferred the work you do in schools and it's having a real impact for teams and also leaders. What would you say makes debating and the skills that come with it so applicable to business and particularly entrepreneurship? I mean, a lot of people that listen to this are founders or operators in startups. So yeah, can you uh, put a case forward for that if you don't mind? Easily. I think Lewis did a really good summary about what makes a good debater. And actually, that is very much why, like, if you took all of those sort of competencies of being able to listen, pivot, frame conversations, be authentic, be kind of vulnerable whilst also being strategic, those are all, you know, chat GPT style, that's what makes a good leader. But like, literally, that, and that is what debating teaches. And debating has been producing business and political leaders for generations. I mean, you've got like some of the most... You wouldn't even think about the people that have done debating, but now you've said, if I say it, someone like Oprah. Oprah was a debater at school. Barack Obama obviously was a debater. A lot of comedians like David Baddiel, he did a lot of debating at school. So it's a, it's a interesting kind of uh, pastime when you can sort of track people where they've gone to. You're like, oh, that makes sense. I think the reason why it is so useful in business in general is that it teaches you the ability to engage. So it's uh, debating, as Lewis said, is is dynamic. It's not one way. It's not public speaking. It's not presenting. And to be honest, unless you're like constantly pitching or you're, you know, running town halls all the time, the amount of time that people actually spend public speaking is quite low in, in people's day to day. The more common are the conversations you're having interpersonally, you know, the the small group meetings or the small client meetings or the one on ones. And that's actually where you need to be able to not just get your point out really well, but also crucially listen and then pivot. Um, what Lewis said in terms of the way that you can somehow kind of cross your notes out and start and like go down a different track if you get the vibe of the room, it's so true in business. You know, good salespeople are able to read their audience. They're able to see where what's kind of read the room and challenge accordingly. And there's obvious in sales. But even if you're, and I think to this point now in terms of why debating is has always been useful but it's particularly useful now when the world has become a lot more integrated functions within business have become a lot more integrated so it's no longer enough to just have like back office and front office people i genuinely believe the only reason i got my training contract at my law firm was because i can speak to people like i was nowhere near as clever as anyone else on that room but they could put me in front of clients and because i was a debater i could explain complex information well that was the only reason and there were a lot of really smart brainiacs who would be in the back room and would never be loud in front of clients that's different now like it's that that kind of separation doesn't exist everyone needs to be able to talk to everyone and particularly if you're very technical or you're very detail orientated um or you've got a subject matter expert being able to explain that those concepts and that information to people in a really simple easy to understand way who don't have the same knowledge base that you've got is crucial so i think that's one major skill and i think the second major skill is the ability to to challenge and disagree well which I know we'll probably get onto a bit later but the world has become so polarized and the impact of kind of social media and the TikTok TikTokification of the world cancel culture and all these things like it's really hard to have disagreements well and people don't really know how to do it because for so long it was just you just didn't people weren't taught to disagree well and something that always strikes me when you're around debaters and people who debate um, who debate, you know, my team anyway, like everyone just debates all the time and they can really challenge each other, but it's done really respectfully, really positively. And you leave, there's a right and the wrong. Someone's got their way and someone hasn't, but ultimately there's respect and they kind of leave as mates. So I think in business, those skills are so important and particularly with the advent of AI and the threat that that's having in the job market um, and the opportunities that that's creating in the job market. I think these skills are really important. Now for entrepreneurship, specifically the capacity to pivot to read the room and pivot and always have something to say i've seen in my own journey when raising investment or trying to sell or pitch for new team members to join you the ability to pivot and reframe i would say are are crucial entrepreneurial skills because if you've got the confidence to as i said before go into any room it means you will and if you don't have the confidence you're really going to struggle and you're going to hold yourself back so 
yeah yeah great great points thank you very much Lewis you told me earlier that it's never too late to get into debating so this is a challenge for myself and there are going to be people listening to this that also go okay maybe I should give this a go so what is your advice for for getting into debating later on in life and how can leaders listening to this bring debating or, or some of the learnings from debating into the sort of day-to-day running of their teams to make their organizations uh, run and be more effective yeah I mean I think especially if you're uh... An entrepreneur, you're growing a company, you're trying to build your reputation. There's actually quite a lot of opportunities to engage your what I call competitive storytelling. One of the things you know, we help entrepreneurs with their communications, especially from a social impact perspective. And one of the things that we build into our strategy is just getting out there and building the reputation of the business. But that doesn't just have to be the founding team. And I think spreading those opportunities to all members of the team is really important. Even if it might feel like it's a forum that doesn't have like huge amounts of investors there, doesn't have the big names there, actually just giving people the opportunity to go on a panel and speak or give a keynote is really, really, really important. And so for me, I think that's something to consider. I mean, the second thing is in an organization, you can make time to basically have this as part of your culture. Um, Every day in our organization, for example, Around 9.45, we have a whole organization meeting where we talk about the news. We talk about what are the big issues that are in the papers this morning, what's been on the radio, and we kind of have a bit of a debate. And we kind of ask people for their opinions. Does this matter? Why does it matter? Who is affected by it? Who agrees with this? And we, we actually, for about half an hour every morning, we have, a, we have a debate in the morning about the news and how it impacts our clients. And it's really useful, A, because obviously people practice their skills and that's almost a simulation of kind of what we do with some of our clients, actually gives us content to go and speak to our clients about uh, proactively. So it's not just a good way of developing capacity, it's actually quite good for our ability to service service clients. So I think it's about being creative and finding moments where you can actually create space, but don't see it as a cost or, oh my gosh, the team are not doing their job, they can't take half an hour out of our day. Actually, when you can see the clear business benefits, I think it, it makes that makes proposition even easier. It's a really good point. No, thank you. I think that's definitely something we could all bring into day to day and it will clearly have a big impact. I think just as much about giving confidence and giving people a chance to to share their thoughts and opinions and, and start to create that healthy tension that comes from sharing ideas and disagreeing, but hopefully disagreeing agreeably. Thinking about communication more broadly, Scarlett, what tips do you have for any of our listeners about how they can have more impact when they communicate? It's a really good question. And my number one tip for having impact is you've got to be yourself. Like, don't try, as Lewis said earlier, to try and be anyone else. Like, that, if you try and stand up and speak, you know, like you think powerful, impactful people speak, and that's just not your vibe. Like, me and Lewis have very different styles of communicating. If I tried to be like Lewis, it would just fail and it would reek of inauthenticity and I would have zero impact. So the first thing is you've just got to be yourself and be comfortable in that. And whatever it is, if you're a jokey person, if you're casual, if you're quiet, if you're loud, whatever it is, just own it. And I think another way you can have impact is to be front load what it is you're trying to say. People think that when you're communicating the the, the storytelling, you kind of have to build up to the, the punchline. But the reality of it is people lose track of what's going on like people have you know short attention spans even if it's just a few minute presentation you're giving or conversation you're having like people zone out they're thinking about the ricardo shop they're thinking about what the football team's doing or maybe they're like thinking about something you said previously and they're not really engaging and it's not a nasty thing it's not a deliberate kind of oh they're boring so i'm not listening it's just human nature so we always say um front load front load what it is you're saying front load the ask and don't build up to it when you front load it and then you and then you work backwards so be yourself front load what it is you're saying and try and connect with the person that you're that you're speaking to so whether it's you know a bit of small talk but not like crappy oh it's hot today isn't it like genuinely just like have a chat with them have a joke be yourself um that really helps build the connection because then that calms you down and, and it calms the other person down and i think you can practice these skills. As Lewis said, he does it in his his daily stand-up. We do it in our all hands. You know, we do debates. And one really good way of developing that impact muscle is actually forcing yourself and forcing your team 
to take the opposite stand to actually what what they believe so we do it all hands we'll have we empower the team to come up with different topics they want to talk about and then they say it and then sometimes we get people to argue the opposite and actually being able to argue the opposite of what you believe helps you develop empathy which really helps you with the impact that you're trying to have when you are pitching or talking to clients or talking to your team members or communicating with various different stakeholders. Because if you can develop kind of understanding of alternative points of view by genuinely having to like put yourself in their shoes and and argue for it as if it's your own, that really helps you connect with people. Um, Particularly if it's a more kind of traditional adversarial situation, a negotiation or something like that, right? So, um, yeah, I would say really think about how you can develop that empathy um, framework. I love that. The idea of putting yourself in the other person's shoes and actually arguing their perspective, I think is a great way of getting a more holistic view of topics. And as you say, having empathy for other people's opinions, which is frankly lacking a lot in society as a whole. And I think it's probably one of the reasons we are where we are. I guess that's a perfect segue to talking about the general election coming up, the state of the world in 2024, which at times can be quite depressing, but I want to keep it positive. Disagreement, as you say, society has become quite a divided, but we know how important it is to disagree and, and learn to disagree with each other. So Lewis, why is that so important? And how can we disagree, but still stay respectful and continue to sort of move conversations forward, make sure that they're productive rather than destructive? I'm going to slightly change the premise of that question insofar as I'm not sure we are as divided as I think maybe certain narratives kind of portray. I mean, there's a, there's a range of issues that I think there is consensus over. We, we naturally, we do a lot of polling of various groups. And actually, if you take climate change, if you take sort of the diversity, equity, and inclusion agenda, despite what you might hear from parts of the media, Actually, there is a consensus that, you know, it's usually seen between 60, 70% of the country, it's in the country on these issues and these agendas. So I, I, I sometimes think we've maybe assumed there's more disagreement, but look, there are issues clearly where people have a difference of opinion. And I think there are, we have to kind of, I think, create spaces for people to have disagreements in. I think it sounds very practical, but lots of people kind of, vent on social media, for example, or don't have an outlet to have that disagreement. And I think creating the spaces in our communities for people to do that and kind of almost rediscover that civic nature that we kind of used to have, which is we will gather together, we'll have a discussion and there'll be an outcome based on it. But I've at the very least had the opportunity to have my views heard, I think is important. I think the second thing is, I think it's important to kind of see the empathy in people. We uh, Scarlett and I have had this conversation many a time. You can completely disagree with someone. I think that their kind of view is wrong. But I think it is not incompatible with also saying this person is a human. They are a valuable person in society. They are worthy of respect and love. And afterwards, we can still kind of shake hands and, and kind of go on. Really amazing thing about the debate program, for example, is after young people kind of have a debate, they have to shake hands at the end of it. And I think that's symbolic of of the fact that you can be friends after. So for me, I think we need to get to a place where on a lot of these issues, which are going to quite cause quite a huge amount of social disruption, potentially, we have to think about how we balance off creating spaces for people to kind of really vent, not relying on pe- people's social media channels to be able to do that because that's a poor forum, but also at the same time, recognize that we need to kind of build empathy in the discussions that we have with people without necessarily rushing to kind of condemn them or see them as one, which I think is part of the discourse today. It's great, great advice. Thank you so much. Scarlett, before we get to our wrap-up questions, what advice do you have for anyone that's looking to get better at disagreeing while still getting their point across to someone with an opposing view? And do you have any examples of where you've seen this done really well? Yeah, I agree in terms of what Lou is saying, in terms of we need more spaces. But I actually think it's even deeper than that. Like, it's not just, you know, creating a time at the after work for people to actually disagree. It's, I think people have lost the skill. And whether they ever had it, I don't know. But I think the skill of disagreeing well has gone, not because people don't have it, but because particularly in a business culture, like we see it with our, with kind of in the corporate space, there's just been this 
adverse reaction to disagreement. And as Lewis said, people take it, can take things very personally. And like what tends to happen is it's just the most senior or the loudest or the most confident person who sort of does what they're doing and says what they're saying. And then a lot of people don't feel comfortable to speak up, even if there is in theory the space for people to speak up. They don't really have the skills to. There's a kind of inclusion element there as well, because particularly if we're dealing with somewhere like London or in New York or somewhere like Singapore or Dubai, where it's so, so diverse, so many different cultures, there are so- certain cultural norms with regards to disagreement and challenging and speaking up. And in a lot of cultures, it's sort of not appropriate to challenge someone more senior or older than you, right? Um, not in a traditional sort of Western way of disagreeing. It doesn't mean disagreement can't happen. It's just people don't feel that that's right for them. So they don't do it. And actually, what you've got to do, as Lewis said, you've got to start from a place of respect and you've got to start from a place where people can feel comfortable and challenging. And so what I would say is to help people get better at disagreeing. I think people do disagree. They have the challenges there. They just don't know how to articulate it. So we always say kind of prep the groundwork first by never going in with, I hear you, but, or, yeah, but that's wrong because like, don't go in just with the, with the what's wrong. You've got to start with the what's right. Start with what you agree about what they've said, or if there's nothing about what someone said that you agree with, nothing at all with something, the point that someone's made. If you can't agree with the outcome that they've suggested, or you agree perhaps with the mechanism that they've put in place, but then you don't think it's going to lead to the outcome that they've said, it's going to lead to a different one. If there's nothing at all that you can agree with, at least show the person that you're speaking to that you have listened. And the way that you do that is literally by repeating back to them in your own words. So it's not like patronizing, but repeating back to them what you have heard them say. Because what that does is it shows to the person that you are challenging that you're coming at this from a place of having listened to them. You're not just listening to respond, uh, lis- you know, you're actually listening to understand. Um, but crucially, it means that you can actually make sure you've understood what it is they're saying. So you acknowledge or agree in some way. So that's the first step of disagreeing well. The second step is then really identifying where the disagreement is. Because sometimes we'll say, yeah, but that's completely wrong. And then actually what you realize is it's not everything that they said is completely wrong. It's just one particular bit of what they said. And if you're trying to be constructive in your disagreement, which is the whole premise around disagreeing well, it's that we can be constructive, we can have a back and forth and hopefully agree on a common goal. Or if not, at least we agree on one particular course of action but the other person's views have been heard so identify down where your disagreement is and then explain it don't just say you're wrong because you've said x and that's wrong explain why x is wrong so if you do those three steps we call it a debate mate aie so you acknowledge you identify and you explain that i think means that you get a lot of the kind of uncomfortableness that people have when it comes to disagreeing out of the way it can be done in a really respectful way Um, leaders can make sure that they're not scared that people are just going to disagree with each other all the time. And most importantly, people can leave those conversations feeling listened to and feeling heard. So I'd say that those are the kind of three steps to disagreeing well. And then in terms of where I see this done well, I mean, I think the politicians and I think the debates have just been appalling and I really just not even going to engage in that. I think, you know, a lot of podcasters do really well, like, you know, the rest is politics, Alistair Campbell, Rory Stewart, I think disagree very well together. But I'd say where I've seen it done particularly well is actually when we did a, an event last year and we had Gary Neville, Alistair Campbell and Lewis all debating each other. And I think Gary Neville did an excellent job of disagreeing with Alistair because he did that thing where he disagreed with everything he said, but made it seem like they agreed on loads. And actually, by the end of it, you kind of were like, okay, they disagree with each other, but actually there's a lot of commonality. And that is kind of, I think, where a good a good disagreement comes because you have the back and forth. They were on, literally on opposing sides of this of this debate, like on the stage, opposing sides. It got quite heated. But at the end of it, you were like, it was done on a way where kind of the respect was shown to the other side, the logic was shown to the other side, the, the logic was um, acknowledged on the other side. And yeah, there was that kind of common framework. I think that's probably an example of where I've seen it done well quite recently but I mean come into my office anytime you guys are welcome they disagree with each other well all the time it's amazing to see love it love it thank you so much well we're sadly at an end we've got two final quick wrap-up questions to ask so Lewis coming to you first this is called to be the mentor so I have to ask if you could be mentored by anyone dead or alive who would it be and why I'll cheat and maybe give you two answers to that I think the first actually would be one of my grandparents in part because I actually 
one set of grandparents I never met and one set I met only once. So I actually think their experiences would have been absolutely fascinating and experiences are really a uh, useful way of kind of gaining understanding for kind of your own own experiences. So I actually would love to be mentored or to be mentored by any one of them. The second answer, a bit different, probably someone like Jose Mourinho. I'm kind of fascinated by his focus, his approach to winning and success and the preparation for that, but also kind of brings his personality and imposes that in terms of what he does. So I'm, I think I'd pick him actually. Great answer. Thank you. And Scarlett, who would you be mentored by? I also have kind of got two, but only because, I mean, it has to be Beyonce because like she's just the best ever, but they say that your mentor should be someone who's a few years ahead of you so that you can really engage with them and learn from them. And Beyonce is like light years, stratospheres ahead of me. So I'm not going to choose Beyonce. I'm going to choose Grace Beverly, who I just think is incredible. She, uh, CEO of Tala, founder of Tala, not CEO, founder of Tala, Shreddy. I think she's incredible as a businesswoman. I am so impressed by her ability to get things done. She's really strategic. I think I would learn a lot from her, even though she's what probably 10 years younger than me. Like I just think she's incredible and she manages to do what she's doing and constantly achieve and constantly give credit where it's due and acknowledge all the help she gets. And she does all of this with a sense of humor and like retaining her kind of authentic way she is. And I just think she's really inspiring. So I would love to be mentored by her. Love that. Well, Grace is a, another former Forty minute mentor who I will try and try and get to our forty minute annual drink so you can meet and maybe start that mentorship relationship. That would be pretty cool. No, I can't promise I won't be on call. <laughs> <laughs> and final questions: What last piece of career advice would you like to leave our listeners with, Lewis? I'll start with you. I think have a hinterland, have kind of a thing or activity that you do, which kind of allows you to have fun, but also kind of reflect a bit and takes you out of the day to day and then kind of allows you to think a bit creatively. So for me, it's sport or music. I'm off to Glastonbury next week. I mean, you come back recharged and kind of, it kind of stimulates, for me anyway, it stimulates you. So I meet quite a lot of founders and leaders who don't have a hinterland and kind of regret it. So, and someone gave me that advice. So yeah, that would be my advice. Love that. And what about you, Scarlett? What advice would you like to leave our listeners with? One of the kind of, core sayings that debate me is JFDI just effing do it and I honestly think that is the best piece of advice I think people overthink things all the time and they try constantly trying to plan and strategize and wait for the perfect time and actually if you know what it is you want to do just do it just start like you figure so much out in the way beg for you know forgiveness not permission and just do it and don't be afraid to work hard I think there's this whole kind of tendency now people are kind of shying away from hard work and I get you know there's the toxicity of hustle culture and all of that but like hard work for something that you want just get started just do it you can figure out how you get there on the way as I said I don't really believe in failure so you can figure out how you make it a success once you've started but people get to this paralysis and they overthink things so just do it enjoy it love that what a great place to end it lewis scarlett thank you so much this has inspired me and i couldn't be more grateful for this conversation because i think it's just what the country needs to hear and our audience needs to hear right now so thank you very much and yeah look forward to catching up with you both hopefully in person when we can see scarlett and maybe grace uh, create this mentorship relationship thank you so much Thank you so much for tuning into today's episode. I really hope that you found it useful and inspiring. If we have left any questions unanswered, or if you have any feedback or guest recommendations for future series, then please make sure you get in touch on info at jbmc.co.uk. I often get asked by listeners how you can help us spread the word about 40 Minute Mentor. There are two simple ways you can help. Firstly, share this episode on your preferred social media platform, and LinkedIn is probably where I'm most likely to see it. And you can also leave us a review on either Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Every share on social media and review left on the podcast platforms really helps us to get 40 Minute Mentor in front of new audiences and share the power of mentorship even further. Thank you so much for your ongoing support and I look forward to seeing you again next Wednesday for even more pocket-sized mentorship.